So compost is made out of two major components. You have uh, carbon-based waste, which is shredded paper, mulch, and then you have nitrogen waste. Nitrogen waste, nitrogen waste is typically food waste, um, and here at U of L, the food waste is often collected in these sorts of large trash cans, specially purposed for composting. So in your operation, you'll want to figure out what your sources are of compostable waste, where are you getting your nitrogen sources, and where are you getting your carbon sources. We have coffee bags on the bins. The coffee bags help keep uh, some of the invasive pests out of the bin. It helps keep the odor down. It's a carbon layer on the top or a second carbon layer to absorb odor. It also keeps moisture and heat in the bin. So these are all things that we think are very attractive uh, when we're setting up a composting bin. So we're fortunate at this operation to have coffee bags donated by Heine Brothers Coffee and Quills Coffee, uh, which are local coffee roasters and coffee shops. Um, if you're setting up an operation, you'll want a source of coffee bags. The nice thing about coffee bags is they're easy to lay down and they're easy to remove. You know, you can use other sources of carbon layer, but it's difficult to remove them. These will eventually decompose into the bin, but they last quite a while out in the elements. Of course, you want something that's going to be robust since you're leaving it out here, uh, you know, under the sky all the time. So after a few weeks, the food waste becomes soil. We compost in dumpsters, and we use hand tools for aerating the compost. It's important that you aerate the compost because a properly aerated compost bin that uses anaerobic bact or uses aerobic bacteria to make the compost makes compost much faster and with uh, sort of better nutrient qualities for immediate use with planting than an anaerobic environment. So what you want is to turn this compost regularly and make sure that oxygen gets to all parts of it. We turn our compost several times during the first couple of weeks, and then we try to turn it about once a month. Our operation is done with all volunteer labor, and so it's difficult to get people to uh, come out and turn the compost with hand tools. But it's also a more sustainable way because we're using human labor. So you might want to think about your own process of making sure that the compost can get regularly maintained before you set up your urban composting system because ongoing labor is going to really be necessary. So the second stage of your urban composting operation should involve vermiculture. Ultimately what you're trying to do is take the compost that you make in one part of your operation and feed that compost to red wiggler worms in another part of your operation. <clears throat> what we have here at U of L is part of our vermiculture operation. You can see we have a variety of bin types. We've tried to recycle materials in every case. Um, we have small batch vermiculture going on here. These uh, these worm populations are eating the compost that we've made from the trash that you saw earlier in the video. Um, and really the people who tend the worms look at them as livestock. We want to treat the worms like um, we might treat livestock, maybe if you treat livestock very well anyway. Our goal is to keep them alive as long as possible and red wigglers have been known to live as long as a decade. 
if they're uh, cared for and if the, the habitat remains uh, robust for them. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to continually increase our worm population. Uh, we have not made much use of vertical space uh, here at U of L, but we will. Uh, for now, uh, we're just getting started on our vermiculture operation, and I'll show you uh, the specifics of it now. When you're setting up an urban vermicomposting operation, you'll need some sort of indoor space. Uh, worms like the same sorts of temperatures we do. When it gets up above about 110 degrees, worms are very uncomfortable and it's hazardous to their health. When the temperature uh, gets up below about 50, then they get cold like we do and, and they can freeze and, uh, and rupture as a result of that freezing. So um, you want to have a somewhat climate controlled area uh, and you want to have some containers. So as you see in this place, we have several different kinds of containers. Uh, these are rain barrels, which are just old flavor barrels that have been cut in half. So you see some of those. Again, uh, barrel or uh, containers uh, that you might find at any gardening or home improvement store. Storage, cold storage containers uh, here. Uh, something that you'll also want, five gallon buckets. I think are really good. Uh, we get a lot of our donation material in five gallon buckets and we sort much of our vermicompost with the five gallon buckets. You can also use it to transport compost to the vermicomposting operation. It's very convenient. Uh, you'll also maybe want a wheelbarrow. So we have a wheelbarrow uh, and then maybe some hand tools, right? So, you know, just something like this in case you don't want to use your hands uh, to turn the compost, which you'll have to do regularly. You need to aerate the so one thing that you'll want uh, for composting operations, in addition to the tools I've already shown, um, is a pair of good rubber gloves. I like this version. These are PVC coated heavy rubber gloves. Uh, they go up past the wrist. They're very durable. Uh, now you don't, you may not need it in vermicompost because vermicompost um, has uh, beneficial bacteria for humans in it. Uh, the worm's gut kills a lot of uh, really harmful bacteria, some E. coli, salmonella, and other bacteria uh, are killed in the worm's gut during the vermicomposting process. So you don't really need gloves to sort through your vermicompost, but if you're going through raw compost, which if I'm using to pull the worms out, um, of the bins uh, so that I can reuse them and then plant with the vermicompost, then uh, I'm, I'm going to want gloves for that. Also, if I'm dealing with the compost itself and its containers, I'm going to want the gloves. You're going to want the gloves because you're going to process trash to do uh, composting. So all of these kinds of activities um, make these kinds of gloves really good. Um, often you'll find pieces of wood, plastic, even metal in your composting mix, and you want this, it does a really good job repelling uh, those kinds of materials that will be, uh, you know, hazardous to your skin. Vermicompost is the poop of this red wiggler worm, okay? And if you look at my hands, you see these individual pieces of soil. That's what you want when you have vermicompost. Uh, vermicompost looks like individual dots of soil and it clumps together very well as you can say you see here on my fingers uh, and my fingernails but when you sort of roll this around it ends up coming apart very easily into individual pieces. Each of those contain micronutrients um, and their water soluble crystalline structure that surrounds them uh, allows them to attach readily to young plants roots. So that's what you want as a finished product is this sort of very dark, um, crumbly um, uh, soil that, that really is, is sort of, you can see that it's a collection of individual pieces, much as coffee grounds look, I suppose, right? So it clumps together, maybe you can see very easily in this, in this hand, clumps but individual pieces nonetheless. I also want to show you this. This is a worm egg. Um, they are very light white in color all the way to dark brown, but this is about the size that you will find. And so if you have a good worm habitat, you will have worm eggs. Um, and uh, you should be able to locate those throughout your bin um, at various times during the worm's uh, life cycle. So. Ultimately, if you're going to have an urban composting operation, you want to have some uh, use for the compost and the vermicompost that you make uh, through uh, your repurposing of the trash. 
And so at U of L, we've established the Garden Commons. And here at the Garden Commons, there's a greenhouse, several raised beds, some in-ground gardening. We have rainwater capture to water the whole thing. And the soil that we use in these boxes is soil that, uh, that is generated by the volunteer uh, food waste composting project. We also amend the soil with vermicompost made by the volunteer food waste composting project. So at U of L, we're closing the loop on our trash by having um, a system where we keep the trash on campus, making soil uh, from that trash and then using that soil to grow more food. The food that's grown in the Garden Commons is available for the entire U of L community's use. Uh, students and other members of the U of L community <coughs> harvest this. Uh, we have potlucks. We have musical events with um, uh, you know that include food from the garden. And people who are involved in the project just take the food home and, and use it as they see fit. So uh, this is the kind of uh, ending you want to have to your urban composting project, uh, one in which people are using the soil that you create in order to grow more food.